Morgan Pechma, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today, our guest is former governor and current controller candidate, Elliot Spitzer. Elliot, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure for being here. I've heard from some sources that you wavered about whether to enter the race uh, for controller until as late as the day before you announced. Um, is, is that true? I wouldn't say wavered. I mean, I, I think the question was, do I want to jump into a uh, contentious environment. I think the record since then, in terms of the media coverage, would suggest that I, I was correct in judging that it would not be a, it would not be a placid uh, you know, sail across a, a, a pond. It was going to be you know, a rocky you know, surface. But I didn't waver about either my desire to have the job, my the fortitude it takes to go and get into a political campaign, uh, the, the question about whether or not I could do the job in a way that I think will make the public proud. I just questioned whether or not uh, the family was, was up for it, and yeah, here we are six weeks in, and uh, it's go going great, and I couldn't be happier. And you talked about how contentious the campaign has been, and then so many of the politicians that enthusiastically supported you in the past uh, have been among your most vociferous critics this time right. around. Now, what do you make of that reversal? Well, first, I, I think folks should understand what endorsements are and what they're not. Often endorsements are uh, acts of convenience, and I don't say that to diminish either the individuals who've offered them in the past or those who might in the future or those who've offered them either to me or to my opponent this time, but they are acts of convenience based upon the fact that certainly my opponent, uh, until I got in on July 7, had no opposition. So at that point, it was sort of an easy decision to make. But what they're not is really statements that move votes. Votes are driven by the voters' understanding of what the record is, what the candidate stands for, whether the candidate fights for, whether the candidate's independent or not. And, and those are the values that have, I think, motivated voters thus far in the campaign, at least, to be supportive of my candidacy. And so I think you look at the endorsements as one who has been both the uh, recipient in prior campaigns and sometimes not. I won in 98 without endorsements. I won in 02 and 06 with all the endorsements. It, it, it may be, maybe you feel better when you wake up with endorsements, but it has never swayed the votes that were outcome determiner. You have said that you really want to expand the reach of the controller's office, and today you've come out with several policy plans that delve into areas outside of the right. traditional scope of the office. And that would seem to affirm a belief I've heard expressed by a number of people that if you were both who support and, uh, and oppose your candidacy, that if elected, you'll style yourself as a rival to the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, is it legitimate to anticipate that that would be your relationship? No. In, in, in fact, I think the better metaphor is what I did as attorney general. I, I restyled the attorney general's office. When I got there, it was an underutilized, undervalued piece of government whose jurisdiction I was able to transform, I think, it's fair to say, into something quite different. Having said that, my relationship with George Pataki was great. He and I never disagreed publicly. I was his lawyer. I always gave him great representation. I always told him even though we disagreed on issues, those disagreements were discussed in private and were not properly the subject of public discourse because it was a cordial and, and, and it was a partnership. And so that is what I certainly look forward to, if I'm lucky enough to win, with any of the mayoral candidates, because that's our responsibility. Politics and campaigning ends at the point of the election, then you have to govern. But when you were attorney general, you had not yet been governor, and now if you are the, the comptroller, I mean, there, isn't there a, a legitimate fear that you would overshadow the, the mayor, uh, regardless no, no, of who he or she yeah, is? You know what, the mayor's the mayor. The mayor will have the, the constitutional, I guess in the context of the city, the city, the charter authority given to the mayor, which is enormous. It's a strong mayor system. I'm in favor of that. The comptroller is there as uh, a part of the government, but only a part. The mayor sets the budget, runs the agencies, is the dominant force, can craft the deals with the city council. That, that executive authority rests as it should in the mayor's office. Would you ever use the power of the audit or refuse to register city contracts to gain leverage over the mayor? Well, let me rephrase the question, not to try to be cute. Yeah. E ever is obviously a dangerous word. If I thought the contract were not properly legally structured, then the answer is yes, because that's the responsibility of the controller. Would I ever fail to approve a properly authorized contract for a political reason? No. In other words, I think the contract approval process, and I had it when I was Attorney General. Attorney General reviews state contracts for legal propriety, and the controller's responsibility is not entirely dissimilar. In other words, there is a, a zone of review that does not become a policy judgment review. In other words, the, the controller is not meant to substitute his or her 
policy judgments for those of the mayor. That, so would, that would be an overreach. It would not be political or ideological, but it would be. No, a, a, it, it, there are bounds. Ways. That's correct. Now, now there, there are many ways the controller can participate in policy conversations, and rightly so. But using the opportunity to refuse to approve a contract because you disagree on a policy issue exclusively is not the right way to do it. Um, is the controllership the last job that you would have your sights set on, or would, would we see this as a stepping stone for uh, you, again, look, to pursue uh, higher office? Look, look, as a lawyer, I'd say it's a compound question with many different <laughs> pieces in it. Look, I'm 54. I, I, I'm seeking a job I very much want to do and do well and do properly. I don't think about jobs that come thereafter. I, I never have. When I ran for attorney general, I really wasn't thinking about running for governor. And when I was an assistant DA, I wasn't thinking about running for attorney general. You do jobs and f seek out jobs that you think are going to be interesting, rewarding. If you do them well, you worry about the future down the road. That, that's all I can tell you. So you would not rule out anything? You know, I don't rule out becoming a farmer. I don't rule out becoming a teacher again. I don't rule out going back to TV. I, you don't rule things out because life is full of uncertainty, and that is what makes it exciting. One of the few things that... Uh, Farmer's probably less likely. But. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the few things that Comptroller Liu and Mayor Bloomberg agreed upon was the need to consolidate the city's five pension funds into one. Would you try to revitalize that effort? Yes. I mean, I, I think that was a, a wise proposal. There are inefficiencies that are costly to the city, costly to those who will receive their, their pensions, um, that, that we should, should certainly try to streamline and bring in-house the decision-making about how the assets are managed. Um, we're paying $400 million in fees right now and getting subpar performance. And I'm not saying that to be critical of the individual asset managers, but you look at that and you see a disconnect to pay $400 million, which is a big number, even when spread across $140 billion uh, asset base. You should do better, and we're not. Our columnist, Alexis Grinnell, writes on the current issue of city and state that branding prostitution as inherent, is inherently degrading to women is unfair that the women who you patronize were well compensated, consenting adults who made the choice to be sex workers. What do you make of that argument? What I make of it is, is that it's an, an area that I'm, I've, I've been avoiding commentary on because I think I'm just not in the right position to, to either pass judgment or participate in that conversation right now. Do you, would you support the legalization of prostitution as Comptroller? I have not really weighed in on that issue and think again that it's just something I'm not going to wade into right now. There is a perception among many people in the business community that through your investigations of companies like AIG and Citigroup that you hurt the city economically. Mm -hmm. Is there any validity to that claim? You know, not only is it not an accurate claim, it's turning reality on its head in the sense that what I said at the time to the folks on Wall Street and to the individuals in any sector, whether it was insurance, finance, um, real estate, uh, any of the multiple sectors we looked at, doing it right builds a stronger foundation and doing it improperly is a road to cataclysm. Now after 2008 when the economic harm that was imposed on the nation was 14 trillion dollars, that's the need, that's the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank has calculated that number. So I mean, maybe it's 12, maybe it's 16, who knows, but 14 trillion dollars as, as an assessment of the harm, that is what we suffered because of the improprieties, the, the leverage, the, the lack of caution, the lack of wise risk management, the fraud, the lack of business understanding that they brought into the system. And it was captured by you know, a guy I like, Chuck Prince, who was general counsel of, of Citigroup. I dealt with him a great deal then, and then he became the CEO at the place after Sandy Weil stepped down. I dealt with him then as well. And he said, as long as the music is playing, we'll continue to dance, which begged the question, who was going to turn off the music? Regulators were absent. I was doing my bit, we were trying, but the federal regulators were gone. And so the music kept playing, they kept dancing, and it got faster and faster and faster until the system collapsed. And so the harm that resulted was not from the investigations. We were telling the world AIG has false accounting, and they did. We were telling the world the analysts are lying to investors, they were. The mutual funds were cheating investors, and they were. And on and on through this, the financial system, as well as all the other stuff we did. Those were the data points that we tried to connect to say, there's danger ahead. And the suffering that resulted was not because of the cases, it's because of the failure on the part of those at the top of the corporations to recognize the reality. You know, Jamie Dimon, nice guy, good CEO, had the reputation until pretty recently as being this Uber CEO, nothing can go wrong at Morgan Chase. Look what has popped out over the last six months. Fundamental fraud after fundamental fraud from the London Whale 
to the gaming of the electrical markets out in California, issues that better management should have addressed. So we've got issues to deal with there, and if we don't, we'll have problems once again. The public, so many members of the public are outraged that they feel that Wall Street has never been reined in uh, despite all the calamities that we endured. Can they anticipate that as controller that you will again take up the mantle of being the sheriff of Wall Street? No, it's a different job. I mean, I hope the SEC, Mary Jo White is beginning to really flex the muscles of the SEC in a way that had not been done in prior years. Uh, Eric Holder is beginning to make some noises that there will be cases coming out of the Justice Department that will be significant. Whether they will be or not, we don't know yet, of course, we'll have to wait and see. Having said all that, the job of the controller is to oversee the budget, the pension funds, and to do many other things. Elias Spencer, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Us. Thank you. Pleasure. And, and that's it for this episode of Last Look. For more episodes, please visit us on the web at cityandstateny.com.